Welcome to Energy Unplugged, the go-to podcast focusing on the global energy transition. My name is Pierre Denry, and I'm Aurora's country head for France. I'm here today with Louise Oriol from RTE, the French National Transmission System Operator, and Jonathan Hoare from Aurora to discuss about a burning issue in the electricity markets, the growth in occurrences of negative price hours on the spot market. Negative price hours are literally hours where producers need to pay to sell their electricity and buyers receive money from purchasing that electricity. As at September 1st of this year, we've had 322 negative price hours in France, around about 5.5% of the time, and a 222% increase compared to last year at the same time of the year. With my guest today, we'll be focusing and discussing on the scale of the phenomenon, its impact, its anticipated evolution, as well as discussing what can be done by regulators, policymakers, as well as private players to manage it. Louise Orion, welcome to the show. You are an expert on electricity regulatory issues and electricity markets. You worked for the French Ministry of Energy in the Electricity Markets Office and then in the Renewable Energy Office. You were responsible, among other things, for regulations relating to renewable energies in France, such as the design and implementation of the feed-in premium scheme, the adaptation of the tendering procedures, the guarantees of origin system, and the development of self-consumption. You joined RT's markets division six years ago as project manager for the integration of battery storage in the power system, and you became advisor to the Director of New Flexibilities for the Power System in 2022, where you deal with flexibilities for balance of demand and supply, as well as solving congestions. So it's really an, an honor to, to have you on the show here with us today. And before we get started, I thought it could be good for our international audience if you can remind us about RT's role in the French Power System, as well as tell us a bit more about your role. Uh, so first, thank you for, for having me. So as you mentioned, RTE is the French uh, transmission system operator. Uh, in fact, it's the biggest grid operator in Europe in terms of grid size and uh, investment. Uh, in short, I would say that we have four missions. Uh, the first one is to develop, operate and maintain high and ultra high line from 63 kilovolts to 400 kilovolts. We have more than 100,000 kilometers of the, those kind of lines. We have almost 3,000 substations and more than 50 cross-border interconnections with our neighboring European countries. Um, our second mission is to provide non-discriminatory access to the grid we operate uh, for consumers, producers, and also storage operators. And the third one is to physically ensure permanent balance between electricity generated and electricity supplied. Uh, last but not least, uh, the last of our mission, I would say, is to inform public decisions through, for instance, our prospective studies. Uh, through our power system outlooks, we give perspective to the policymaker on how to ensure security of supply and how to optimize the French power system at different time scales. Thanks for, for that clear explanation. How about your, your role precisely uh, working on new flexibilities? Uh, yes, so I've been working for almost two years now on uh, defining the flexibility needs from a system perspective uh, and how to meet uh, those needs from uh, 2030 and 2035. Uh, as you mentioned in the beginning, it's both for supply and demand balance, but it's also to, for solving local issues so, such as voltage control or congestion management. So maybe I'd like to start with a slightly provocative question, but why do you actually care about negative price hours? Isn't that just a feature of the market uh, or are there unintended effects? And why is it something that you, that you track as part of your current role? Yeah, so negative spot prices are in fact an interesting phenomenon to look at from the point of view of the need of, for flexibilities. First of all, when we talk about negative prices, mainly if I, we, we talk mainly about spot prices, sometimes indirect prices, but uh, we are not talking about forward or future prices that are not uh, negative so far. Uh, and so we are just talking about a small part of the, the volumes that uh, are traded in the power exchange. But the spot market is, is interesting because it's where most of the physical dispatch is, is decided. So 
as you mentioned, it has a powerful meaning when prices are negative. So we, are, we have producers that are ready to pay to, to generate, which is uh, unnatural. So yeah, this phenomenon is a feature of the market because they are structural to the power market. But there are some regulatory issues that can artificially sharpen, well, deepen the, the negative spot prices or that can make them occur more frequently. So in France, it's the case, for instance, with the feed-in tariff scheme. It's the historical support scheme that we, we have in France. With these schemes, the, the renewable producers don't have any incentive to react to the price signal, so they will Start with, they will continue producing, so it can uh, aggravate the, the negative prices. So yeah, it's may, it might be a, a simplified view, but I'm sure Jonathan can give you more insight on the creation of negative prices. Yeah, actually, be, be, before I, I turn to, to Jonathan, I'd like to understand how big the phenomenon is. So I mentioned the, the figure of 322 hours from January 1st to end of August this year, but what does that represent in terms of curtailed energy or power at, at a given point in time? Um, so yeah, maybe first, so yeah, as you mentioned, the number of hours of negative spot prices has risen dramatically in France uh, since 2023. So it's linked to, to several things. So we have a sharp fall in consumption observed in France and uh, elsewhere in Europe since the energy crisis. And this fall in consumption is combined with two things. The, the first one is an increase in nuclear generation. We have low outputs from the past years. And since this year, the nuclear generation is, is uh, relatively high again. And we had also a lot of renewable generation. So more PV across Europe, more wind as well. And uh, also this year, we had a very good hydro generation, especially during spring. And added to that, we have consumption that is not very flexible so, so far. So we observed that we have we had more negative spot prices on weekends. So that's like maybe like the usual things, but uh, also they are starting to appear on weekdays, which is relatively new. And what we can say is that they are concentrated between between the, the peak in, in PV generation, so between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. And so we have we, ha we haven't done this study for 2024, but in 2023, we observed that we had 0.5 terawatt hours of renewable curtail during the, those episodes. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. So turning to you, Jonathan, uh, you are a senior analyst in our research team in Paris, and you worked over the, the summer on, on those negative price hours. So what comes out of this analysis? What, what is driving those uh, negative prices? Hi, Pierre. Thanks for having me. So firstly, as Louise talked about, when we look at all the negative prices that occur in France, the first is negative prices that are only just below zero. So say 10 cents or 20 cents below zero. And in these cases, it's where normally we might see the power price occurring at exactly zero euros per megawatt hour. So exactly at the price where renewables that can produce power for free uh, would be participating in the market, um, producing power at no cost. However, then due to some uh, bidding strategies from renewables, we can see that price just dip slightly lower. Uh, so some renewables, maybe because they're inflexible and they can't turn down as easily as other renewables, they might want to really make sure that they're in the market and they beat out other renewable generation. So they'll bid at prices that are just slightly below zero, maybe at minus 50 cents or minus one euro. So this is what's causing a large portion of these negative price hours in France, the ones that are slightly below. And then the second group of, of negative prices is when the price goes really low. So we're looking at minus 20, minus 50, maybe minus 80 euros per megawatt hour. If I, I can interrupt you there, uh, Jonathan, before you go on explaining that, uh, going back to, to what you said. So um, could you explain, you, you said some renewable assets are inflexible, so they'd rather produce than not produce. But why is that? What what happens? If, what would happen if if they were not in the merit order, for example? Yeah. So if these assets aren't in the merit order and the wind is blowing and they they want to be able to generate, due to their inflexibility, it might actually cost them a lot of money to to not generate in this hour. So either they'll have to pay to to ramp down and to produce less, or they'll simply generate anyway in this hour, and then they'll be at an imbalance with the system based on what they've said in the day ahead market that they'll produce. And then with this imbalance, they'll end up paying imbalance costs, which again is, is, is not what they want to do. 
So just to outcompete those other renewables, they'll try bidding at minus one, minus two to see if they can make sure they're generating in these in in these hours when the demand is very low and the renewable generation is very high. Okay, that's that's clear. My my understanding though is that in France the, the CFD mechanism is made so that renewables are actually incentivized uh, to curtail at zero. So you're saying technically maybe some cannot, but could you explain that mechanism? How does it work? And if developers are compensated for negative prices, then why are they so worried? Yeah, so the CFD mechanism in France, much like CFD mechanisms in lots of other countries, will set a strike price. And then regardless of the, the spot price that the renewables bid into, they will be topped up back to this spot price. And the way that current contracts work in France, depending on the contract, after the first, say, 15 or 20 negative price hours in the year, if a CFD asset is not producing when the price is negative, it will still receive a portion of this top up from the contract. So CFD assets, if they aren't producing after the first, let's say, 20 negative price hours in the year, will still receive some remuneration. However, this is still a worry for renewable assets. One of the best things about the CFD is you have a certainty about how much you're going to be remunerated. But when the, you don't know how many times the price will be negative and how many times you'll be getting this prime, you aren't sure exactly what your remuneration will be. And this is a worry for, for renewable assets. On top of this, there's the problem of flexibility. Some assets simply cannot turn down in time if the price goes negative for one hour of the day. And so then they wouldn't receive their, their remuneration if they're still generating in this hour at all. So let's move on now. That was what you called slightly negative prices. And then we have very negative prices. Can you uh, tell us a bit more about that? Where do they come from? How are they generated? So when we look at the negative prices in 2024, roughly half of them are, this, are in this period of zero to minus one euro. So slightly negative. And then the other half are these prices that are very negative. So looking at minus 20 euros, right down to minus 90 euros per megawatt hour is the lowest we've seen in France this year. And when we look at what's happening when these prices go this negative, really often um, the price is being imported from neighbours. So the price in France's neighbouring countries will be more negative than the price in France. And France will be importing from these countries. And this is especially true for Belgium and Germany. So if we look at why this happens, there are two things that drive these prices so low. The first is inflexibility in thermal plants this time. And especially in Germany, we see this a lot with lignite plants. So such thermal plants have must-run constraints or generation limits that they have to be producing at, which means that they're willing to pay a lot of money to keep generating to avoid paying these inflexibility costs and will bid very negatively in the spot market. The second thing that drives the price low, and this we see this especially in Germany, is that we see a lot of excess renewable generation and a large amount of renewable capacity that is subsidized to continue to produce when the price is negative. So in Germany, for example, they have a one-sided CFD that will pay out, even when the price is negative, up to quite a high value. So that means that to ensure your renewable generation is, is counted to receive this subsidy, these renewable assets will bid very low in the spot market. And that pushes the price low in, in Germany when you have lots of excess renewable generation. And then this, this excess generation and this price is then imported into France and pushes the French price uh, very, ne very negative as well. When we look at all of the hours in 2024 that were more negative than one euro per megawatt hour, 95% of these were imported from, from Germany and, and, and Belgium. And in these hours, Germany and Belgium were more negative than what we've seen in France. All right. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. I think because, you know, we, we yeah. are a, a forecast company, based on your analysis, how do, you, how do you see those negative price hours evolving in the future? And after that, I, I'd like to ask the same question to, to you, Luis, because I believe RTE is more pessimistic than us on, on this. Yeah, so when we're looking at our forecast for negative price hours, we're taking into consideration those two really important uh, correlating factors that I talked about before. So how does the demand look on the system and especially how does flexible demand look on the system and how does the, the generation of renewables look on the system, especially new renewables that are under generous subsidy schemes that will incent incentivize them to keep producing uh, regardless of what the power price is. 
looking at that demand side in France and in lots of other European countries, we're seeing a really large growth in in battery in, fl- in flexible battery capacity. And this this battery capacity can consume power at these hours when the other demand in the system is very low, and therefore the prices are very low. And this helps push. Uh, this helps consume more of the power in the system and therefore reduces the number of negative price hours. So if we're looking at uh, Central European countries, so France, Germany, the Netherlands and Belgium, where there is lots of excess renewables, out until 2030, we forecast a 135% increase in such battery capacity. This will really help with, with increasing demand in these negative price hours. But we also expect to see lots of other flexible demand in the system. So thinking about electric vehicles, heat pumps, and even electrolyzers for green hydrogen production. And all of this flexible demand in not only France, but in other European countries is forecasted to increase by by a lot until 2030. And this will really help reduce the number of negative price hours by increasing that demand in these low demand periods. The second thing we're considering is that renewable generation. And when we look at this renewable generation, we're looking at the subsidized renewable capacity that will often under a feed-in tariff, so different to the CFD, that will generate even when the, regardless of what the power price is, and will always get this power into the system. And what we're seeing is that, especially out until 2027, the subsidy schemes in uh, our neighbors, so Germany and the Netherlands, are becoming less generous and will no longer be paying renewable assets to generate even when the power price is negative. So this means that there'll be less of this renewable generation in the system. There means there'll be less constraints for, for thermal assets that must generate and that are inflexible. There'll be less pressure on them. So there'll be, there'll be fewer hours when they're bidding very negatively into the system. So all this taken into account, we think that for the next few years, negative price hours will stay quite high. There's still a lot of renewables in the system that flexible capacity build out hasn't started yet. But then from beyond 2026, 2027, we'll start to see the, the effects of that increased flexible capacity. And we'll start to see the, neg- the number of negative price hours uh, in France and in Europe as well decrease. Thanks, Jonathan. Luis, turning to you, what, what's your take on this? In fact, we might not be that pessimistic uh, in terms of, of, well, I will talk mainly about curtail of renewable, but it's obviously linked to the number of uh, negative price episodes that we, we could have. So as I mentioned earlier, in 2023, we estimate the renewable uh, curtailed volume to be around 0.5 terawatt hour. And uh, by 2030, uh, based on our main scenario in the last uh, in our last power system outlook for 2030, uh, the figure you will find in this report is more or less the same. In fact, it's uh, around 0.4 terawatt hours. Uh, but to reach that figure, uh, there are some requirements that, uh, that we must fulfill. Um, in fact, we, we try to, to, yeah, to evaluate what would happen if we had no flexibility, if the system is like it is today, and uh, we could reach up to three terawatt hours of, uh, of uh, curtailed uh, renewable uh, if we do nothing to, to, yeah, to develop flexibility. But the good news is that with flexibility, and uh, it's uh, more or less what uh, Jonathan mentioned just uh, just before, uh, we can uh, reduce this volume dramatically. And what we want to stress is that the most important thing, the thing that has the most effect and the, yeah, the greater effect on the on the, the curtail volume, on lowering the curtail volume, is to re-optimize the existing demand side flexibility. Uh, so I'm not talking about very sophisticated flexibility. I'm just uh, talking about re-optimizing or, or time of use tariffs. Uh, so I don't know if you're familiar with that, but uh, in France in the 1980s, uh, we linked the heating of uh, hot water tanks uh, to the peak of peak tariff, which is a time of use tariff, tariff that we have in France. Uh, it allowed us to reduce the evening consumption by several gigawatts, and so this consumption was shifted during the night, which had historically been a, a low period for consumption. So at midnight, we have currently 10 gigawatts of uh, hot water tanks consumption. And if we put part of those 10 gigawatts and we put it in the afternoon when we have uh, in the moment negative spot prices, we think we could uh, drastically lower the, the phenomenon. 
We have observed up to six gigawatts of, of renewable curtailed in the afternoon. So yeah, 10 versus six, it's a, bad, it's a, it's a good thing. Well, we have a lot of potential, uh, I mean. So if we do that, we have estimated that we could half, more than half the curtailed renewable volume. We could be, uh, we could have uh, one terawatt instead of three in 2030. If we do nothing, yeah, we will have three terawatts of, of curtailed renewable. And to go down to uh, 0 0.4, which is the figure I, I mentioned I, and that you, you will see in our reports, well, this, this reduction is obtained with new flexibility assets, so additional demand side flexibility and battery storage. Uh, so, yeah, so there are, there are, what is important to have in mind is that we, uh, we have ways to, to decrease uh, the, the negative spot prices and uh, the cartel renewable volume. I want to add something. It's that there is still one matter of concern for us. Uh, it is the amount of distributed PV uh, that we will have in the system by uh, 2030 and 2035. Uh, we estimated that we should have uh, up to 20 gigawatts in France by 2030 and more than 30 gigawatts by 2035. So far, this, the distributed PV generation is still under filling tariffs, so it does not respond to negative prices. And if it's not the case by 2030 or 2035, there should at least exist a way to stop them in case of uh, excess of supply. Otherwise, uh, we think we will have a problem to balance the system. Maybe. So if we look at the measures that can be taken to, to reduce negative price hours, and especially focusing on those that can be taken at government level, let's say, what would you say are the, the most important ones? The most important one uh, is the one I already mentioned, is to increase demand side flexibility and to re-optimize the, the existing demand side flexibility. So on that matter, there is an ongoing action by the French regulator to, yeah, to, to re-optimize the, the hours and the off-peak hours of the, of the tariffs. But then it will be up to the distribution system operators to reallocate them efficiently because they are responsible for, for that. Uh, so hopefully we will see some improvement in the in the years to come. Uh, the second one I would say is to further move away from feed-in tariff to contract to CFDs uh, by reducing the the size threshold to for uh, between uh, feed-in tariff and uh, and contract for differences. Uh, so it is already planned by the French government. So the threshold is historically 500 kilowatts. Uh, soon it will be 400 kilowatts, and it will be. 200 kilowatt by 2026. But as, but as mentioned earlier, this it might not be enough because all the distributed PV is below the 200 kilowatt threshold and they will remain, they will remain under the, under the feed-in tariff system. So from our point of view, it is essential to also introduce obligations in the feed-in tariff scheme uh, to stop renewables during a negative spot prices. And as such, like the, the buyer of this generation would change his, his bidding strategy on the, on the power exchange, and uh, we think it could help the, the system. So those are the measures to reduce uh, negative spot prices, but there are some other things to do because as a TSO, we are in charge of balancing supply and demand, as I mentioned earlier. And it's important for us to be able to handle easily these episodes from a, an operation point of view. Uh, and so far, we have learned that, well, in, in practice, it's uh, some, somehow some, sometimes difficult for us to, to balance the system because of, let's say, we, we lack of information or there are some regulatory gaps. So the first thing that is important for us is to be able to know how much uh, of the renewable will stop and where, because we we have observed that all the renewable under, feeding under CFD sorry, is not stopping. So we have, we have troubles to, to evaluate the volume that will stop and it's affecting our balancing strategy. So sometimes we, we do not activate the right volume or we, we, yeah, we activate a volume in the downwards and the need is upwards or yeah, vice versa. The second one is to incentivize balanced responsible parties to be as balanced as possible during those episodes before the TSO takes over so, so that it can limit the need that we will have in, in balancing reserves. The third one is to oblige, not just only incentivize, but I must say oblige uh, renewables to participate in the balancing market so that we have the means to balance, to balance the system uh, if needed. 
So far, we have only 500 megawatts of renewable participating to the balancing market. It's very low. Uh, the potential is, is of 20 gigawatts out of the 40 gigawatts of uh, PV and solar, um, of PV, sorry, and wind that we have in, uh, in France. Because we, we have, very often, we have trouble to, to, to find uh, uh, flexibility in the downwards, um, for downward services. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we have to avoid massive and synchronized stopping of renewables uh, because, if, um, because we, we could have a frequency deviation problem and uh, it could be very, very bad. So to do that, uh, we have to encourage the, the, ramp, the ramping of, uh, of the generation when they stop and restart. Okay, I think this is that's actually a, a very interesting topic, but we could have a whole dedicated podcast on this. So maybe to, to to close on this topic. So you mentioned incentivizing renewables to participate, or actually you said obliging, forcing renewables to participate in the balancing market. Jonathan, I think that's something that is already happening uh, in other countries in Europe, right? Where actually it's it's not an obligation, but there are uh, market mechanisms uh, that incentivize renewables uh, to participate in the N3 services markets. Could you uh, elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, so in, a, in lots of markets in Europe, we're seeing increasing participation of renewables in the balancing markets. One of the real tra trailblazers is in the Spanish market, where there's a lot of renewable capacity due to really high solar and wind resource. And more and more, we're seeing this renewable capacity participate in in the balancing markets. So looking at the secondary and tertiary reserves, this participation is coming in the form of both turn down and turn up actions. So we've talked a lot about negative prices where there's too much renewable generation on the system and we want to turn some of it down. But in some dynamic markets in Spain, we're seeing renewables turning down their generation in advance so that they can then participate in balancing markets in the upwards direction. So we are seeing other markets, it definitely is possible. We're seeing this from Spain, in Hungary, in Finland, in Sweden, in GB. And we're seeing a range of, of different market interactions where sometimes the renewables are turning down via participation in a market freely. And sometimes there is more interaction from the, the state where the state and the TSO is telling renewables that they need to turn down in certain times through the, through the balancing mechanisms. Then maybe a, a final question to, to, to you, Louise. Could we do the same in, in, in France? Could we have, for example, renewables participating in the secondary reserve during those hours of, of negative prices? Or is that something that's technically not viable? Uh, I think they should. They, they could and they should, actually. But yeah, the, the first thing we want is that they participate to tertiary reserve because in France we are, we have what we call the a proactive model, balancing, balancing model, uh, where we anticipate the, the imbalance and uh, we try to correct it before we have to activate uh, automatic reserves such, such as uh, AFR, uh, the secondary reserve. So yeah, the first thing we want is to, to have a more, uh, more renewables in the, the tertiary reserve. Uh, so that's why I was mentioning uh, an obligation. We have so far this obligation uh, for, for upward services and for producer connected to the TSO. Uh, now we want to extend this obligation for also downward services, so reducing the, the output, uh, and the, to extend it to producer connected to the DSO level because it's where most of the renewable is so far. Uh, and uh, above a threshold, we do not want to, to oblige all uh, renewables, but uh, yeah, above a threshold that has to be defined. It could be 10 megawatts, it could be 12 uh, to begin with, and uh, it could be lower in the, in the near future. As for AFRR, there we, ho we also have a, a need for this kind of reserve, and uh, the, our needs are likely to, to increase by 2030. So yes, the renewable should also participate to, to these services. But so, so far, we have, we have uh, zero renewable participating to, to those reserves. Uh, but uh, it's also because uh, our current tools to, uh, to test it if, uh, if the renewable can provide the services are, are not yet uh, 
well, we have not the, the right tools uh, to do that. So now we are more in, a, in an experimental uh, yeah, approach. Uh, so we are trying with a volunteer producer to, yeah, to carry out experiments to validate the participation of renewable uh, in these services. So, yeah, we hope that in a few years they, they could participate more easily to all our balancing mechanism. And, and in fact, uh, yeah, most of the renewable energy power plants connected to R11, so the TSO level, should be able to participate to ancillary services. All right. Thanks a lot, Louise. We, we're reaching the, the end of this podcast. Maybe a, a quick recap. I think the, the key takeaway for me from this very interesting discussion is there are things that regulators can do. You mentioned, for example, reforming peak and off-peak hours, but there's also the bidding behavior of the asset owner, which is likely to evolve in the right direction in the future. So I'll, to finish this podcast, I'll ask you a very quick question to, to both of you. Basically, you tell me underrated or overrated. So concerns around negative prices, underrated or overrated, Jonathan? I think, to be honest, overrated. I think in 2024, we've seen a lot of these hours and it's very new on the system in such large, large quantities. But I think the solutions are in place, be they flexibility or, or subsidy redesign or system regulation there. And I think we'll have to go through a bit of a painful period with lots of with negative prices in this year and probably the next year, a few years as well. But overall, this is a problem that we can solve. Lots of people are talking about it and we'll be able to, to, to bring negative prices to a heel. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Louise, underrated or overrated? Actually, yeah, I, I want to say both. Like Jonathan, I think it's, it's a little bit overrated because we, we know we identify the solutions. And so, yeah, if we can implement them, we, it, it will be better. And so, yeah, it's, it's not a, such a big deal. But I also want to say a little bit underrated because, yeah, we, we know the solution. I hope it won't take too much time to, to implement the, this measure, this measure. And, but yeah, underrated also because, um, yeah, because yeah, we have to, sometimes we, we neglect the operational aspects of the, of the negative price, uh, uh, episode handling and, uh, especially the, the frequency impact. Uh, if we have a, a massive signal where renewables start and stop in a, in a very short period of time. Uh, and this is a, a topic that should not be neglected. All right. Thanks a lot. So underrated, overrated. I think what's what's important is to really to have a good understanding of the issue. And I have to say, I learned a lot today with both of you. So thank you so much, Louise and Jonathan, for taking the time to, to be with me on the show today. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Pierre Dennery. Aurora's country head of France, talking to Louise Oriol from RT and Aurora's Jonathan Hall. Thanks for listening to Energy Unplugged. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to follow or subscribe to the podcast via whatever platform you use.